By August of 1790, the Jacobin Club was reeling from defeat to debacle, the wind absolutely taken out of their sails. The moderate friends of 1789 possessed unrivaled dominance within the National Assembly, exerting control via an unbroken string of Assembly presidencies won by their members. Continuing down this course would mean that the yet-to-be-written constitution would be a conservative document, just as the rights of man had been. Already, the Constitutional Council, whose job it was to prepare and draft the constitution, was stacked with seven moderates. jean Servin Bailly, one of the principal members of the Friends of 1789, was mayor of Paris and worked tirelessly to suppress the saint culot and undermine the radical Jacobins. The Marquis de Lafayette commanded the National Guard, keeping Paris under guard and the king on a tight leash. So preeminent were the friends that even the royal ministry changed their tune and began cooperating closely with them. It was this carefully cultivated power that made the rationalization reforms of previous months a possibility. But no power can be held for long before it begins to corrupt. Something profound was happening to the moderates, a change that had been set in motion weeks earlier after the close of the Fête de la Federace. For better, though probably for the worse, it was becoming a consensus position among the moderates that the revolution was winding down. For the liberal nobles who dominated the moderate faction, the revolution had been a great success. They had navigated the treacherous waters of revolution to arrive at a shore where, materially, they were better off than they had been before and where the king was still availed his God-given crown. Liberal bourgeoisie, middle-class delegates, were similarly disposed. They had acquired active citizenship status, lands and properties, effectively quashed any counter-revolutionary elements, and inaugurated an enlightened modern government for France. Functionally, the moderates were the real winners. Perhaps then it was only natural for the Friends of 1789 to transition in both temperament and tone away from their brand of revolutionary liberalism and into entrenched political conservatism, done so in order to preserve their myriad gains and prevent any encroachment upon their newly acquired powers. Men who had lent their courage, their wit, their talent to the early revolution, guys like the Abbe Sies, Lafayette, Mirabeau, Bailly, Grégoire, Lamette, Barnave, they'd now traded places with their conservative political opponents. Now it was they who would try to close the curtains on the revolution. Now, to be sure, the Jacobins had worked with the Friends of 1789 throughout the year on all of their proposals. But though most were in keeping with the spirit of the revolution, they failed to go far enough to satisfy the Jacobin Club's more radical members. And with the Friends ascendant in the Assembly, the Jacobins were left without the capacity to push their revolutionary agenda. So deprived of a legislative channel, the Jacobins turned to another avenue, public opinion. A renewed populist propaganda campaign from Jean-Paul Marat and the inculcation of anti-assembly sentiment among the already disenfranchised Parisian mob resulted in a minor revival of fortunes for the Jacobins. Marat's newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple, was a phenomenon, digestible for the middle and lower classes alike with its colourful, everyday relatability, coarse language and hilarious cartoons. It tapped into the simmering discontent among the Parisian masses and directed that pent-up ire towards those faux revolutionary delegates who were erecting barriers against the progress of the revolution. Membership in the Jacobin Club spiked in 1790, and up to 1,200 members were recorded in the roles of the Paris Club. Up to 150 other Jacobin Clubs operated throughout France, each with plenty of bums on their seats too. As numbers went up and dissatisfaction with the Friends grew, the Jacobins distanced themselves from the Friends' unpopular reforms. That being said, they stuck to their anti-clerical guns on support for the civil constitution of the clergy, by far the most controversial reform of all. Channeling revolutionary populism, however, was a double-edged sword. Radicalism within the Jacobin Club rose precipitously as the club was shunned from mainstream politics and thus nestled deeper into the radical political underground. Hell, even the word republic was bandied about for a time in leaflets and Jacobin-run newspapers, though the club's leadership continued to support the constitutional monarchy currently in place. Indeed, just as younger, radical members were joining the Jacobins, older ones were leaving. For some of the original constitutional monarchists and liberal nobles, who had established the Jacobin Club, this new populist rhetoric, characterized by acerbic invectives and personal attacks, was too much for them to bear. And those odious first hints of republicanism were all the more reason to tuck tail and run. So as the Jacobin Club was denuded of these more moderate elements, a more radical and revolutionary ideologues came to the fore. In the case of the Paris Jacobin Club, new members would include individuals who were either a part of, or heavily influenced by, the emergent Cordaillie Club. Alignment with the Cordaillie proved to be a godsend. Georges Danton and Camille Desmoulins became distinguished members in September, along with several of their compatriots from among the Cordaillie Assembly. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement. 
As far as the Quadi were concerned, the Jacobins were agreeable enough political allies who might just give them the legitimacy they needed to enter the mainstream of French politics. And for the Jacobins, alliance with the Quadi brought with it a great deal of popular support from among the people. That a kind of political mitosis set in due to the intermingling of new members and perspectives, new ideologies and ideas, was inevitable. The Jacobin club that emerged from this fusion in late September was far more radical and far more revolutionary than it had been even weeks prior. The National Assembly's conservatives were also pushed further to the fringe, so much so that calling them conservatives is a bit of a malapropism. They were ardent monarchists all, but so too were those in power. What they opposed was the current type of monarchy. So those conservatives who opposed the constitutional monarchy can't be adequately described as mere monarchists. They were absolutists, who wanted a fully-fledged return to the Ancien Regime, a full restoration of the powers of the monarchy, and repeal of all revolutionary law and reform. In other words, they were reactionaries. Reactionary absolutists. There weren't many under-reconstructed conservatives anymore, as they, being upper aristocracy, were quitting France en masse, fleeing to exile in nearby states. That most irascible of absolutists, the Comte d'Artois, formed a royal court in exile in Torino, then a part of the Duchy of Savoy. From here he petitioned the rulers of England, Austria, Prussia, Spain and many others to fight for a renewed Bourbon kingdom. Those few absolutists that remained in France operated in secret, as this was their only defence against any revolutionary reprisal. But it was in secret that they plotted a return to the old ways, using their wealth and influence to successfully spark minor rebellions in Provence and Occitane in September. Louis was kept appraised of these developments by his advisers through the Comte Artois' network of secret messengers and by his sister Elizabeth. Though not directly involved, the king greatly encouraged their plots from afar. Between plots, he was absorbed in his own mind, contemplating, well, dreaming really, of a triumphant return to Versailles, a beloved and brilliant king. Although current political winds had left Louis and his absolutist allies becalmed, a change was coming. Dysfunction in government, dissent from the people, and fierce rivalry between the Jacobins and the Friends had left the National Assembly off balance, uniquely susceptible to a crisis. And what a crisis it was. We return then to that oh-so-contentious, divisive and emotional of problems so close to the hearts of the philosophers, revolutionaries and monarchists, the separation of church and state. Having been passed into law in early July, the civil constitution of the clergy's activation was delayed until August in hopes that the king might be induced to support it. But Louis, a pious Catholic, had absolutely no intention of supporting such sacrilege. As far back as September of 1789, he had been in communications with Pope Pius VI, attempting to extract from him a definitive repudiation of the Assembly's anti-clericalism. This mission took on new import when the Assembly first proposed the civil constitution. Louis fully expected the Pope to just slam the constitution outright. After all, in Paris, effigies of His Holiness were being burned, and the godless revolutionaries in the Assembly were trying to secularise in clear defiance of church law. All Louis needed from the Pope was a staunch no. That answer would provide all the political cover and moral authority he needed to defy the Assembly and resist the civil constitution. Still, months passed with no answer. Most recently, Louis and his allies tried again in July, requesting the Pope use the papacy's immense wealth and influence to provide political cover and spiritual counsel for those priests and politicians who wished to oppose the civil constitution. But for whatever reason, Likely an attempt to keep relations cordial and channels of communication open, Pope Pius did not deliver a definitive answer until July. By then, going into August, the pressure the Assembly brought to bear on Louis had grown irresistible. So, with great reluctance, the King agreed to endorse the civil constitution, provided they sustained the law enabling his suspensive veto. Backlash was immediate. Thirty bishops signed their names to a letter declaring that they could not, in good conscience, commit to the constitution without papal consent. Over the next few weeks, fierce confrontations occur between partisan politicians from both perspectives, as secular authorities hit hard at clergymen who refused to abide their decree. What irked them so was the seemingly innocuous Article 21, which demanded an oath of loyalty to the kingdom and the people. Swearing this oath without the Pope's consent was tantamount to an act of treason against the church. Those priests and bishops who refused to abide the oath were given the derisive name of non-juring priests, refractory priests, or intransigent priests, variously. Believing they held the moral and religious high ground, the non-juring priests resisted for months. This forced the National Assembly to consider coercive measures to compel them to yield. 
Article 21 provided the framework for a new oath of loyalty called the Civic Oath. Where Article 21 had only implied it, the Civic Oath explicitly subordinated the Gallic Church to the Kingdom. Coming to a head on November 27th, the Assembly demanded all clergymen, even those who had sworn the original oath, to swear the Civic Oath, unconditionally. And for most, it was an impossible ask. Only around half of the clergymen swore the oath. Those that refused found themselves martyred, in a sense, expelled from the French Catholic Church. By the end of January 1791, most upper clerical positions were vacant, and only the most patriotic and enlightened, or the most stoic and incorrigible, remained in office. Popular outcry at such bold-faced anti-clericalism ran hot, and what had begun in November as demonstrations held in front of government buildings morphed into devastating riots in the new year. Hotbeds of clerical support out in the countryside transformed into bastions of anti-assembly revolt. Yet for all the popular support the non-juring priests enjoyed in the countryside, protests in the cities carried a sharp anti-clerical edge. From Picardy to Provence, churches and convents were raided, clergymen were accosted and occasionally lynched. Critics of the revolution were made to recant or else murdered. Even plays were staged recalling the worst excesses of the papal inquisition to inveigh the people against the church. And of course the propagandists had a field day, distilling anger down into cartoons and pamphlets. Such was the scale of the upheaval that some of Louis's closest advisers plotted to spring him from captivity and deposit him in the opened arms of loyal army units. Mirabeau himself even beseeched the king to form a court in exile. Mirabeau himself beseeched the king to form a court in exile in royalist strongholds in the south. Still, for however bleak things appeared, Louis refused to flee. He was no coward, and after all, he had sworn an oath to uphold the constitution and to protect the people. It would take two shocking ordeals for him to break his word. The first of these ordeals came in February. Louis's aunts, pious Catholics as they were, requested permission to travel to Rome for papal communion. Amidst the political maelstrom spurred on by the civil constitution of the clergy, such a request proved highly contentious, particularly among the Jacobins. But largely in ignorance of these misgivings, the king granted his approval to his aunts on the promise that they would return swiftly. Naturally then, the aunts went to Rome, never to return. Oh dear. Their deceit sparked rumours that the king was somehow responsible. Did he facilitate their escape? Did he plan to help more nobles flee? Murat and the radical press went ballistic, charging Louis as the architect of a conspiracy to flee the capital. And when Murat spoke, Parisians listened. The sans were particularly perturbed by these rumours. A few weeks later, on February 28th, and a mob of several thousand led by Antoine Santerre descended upon a prison in the Vincennes commune of Paris. Rumour had it that the prison housed a secret passageway to the king's residence in the Tuileries, a passageway by which he and his blue-blooded friends were planning to escape. Despite the National Guard's best attempts to disperse the crowd, the sans culottes were not deterred. Lafayette himself, personally present, was attacked multiple times and narrowly escaped with his life. And the Marquis was not the day's only near miss. As the Vincennes was occupied, a sans culot, armed to the teeth with pistols, bombs, swords, daggers, you name it, nearly climbed his way into the Tuileries. His target, King Louis. The man was apprehended, but not before Monarchist noblemen rushed to the Tuileries to protect the king, swords in hand. Despite their good intentions, these noblemen had just illegally occupied the Tuileries. Having gotten nowhere at the Vincennes, Lafayette turned around as he heard news of the situation at the Tuileries. There, he found 400 swords swinging noblemen, and not without good reason, Lafayette mistakenly believed he had stumbled upon the first phase of a reactionary absolutist coup. Still, he gave the intruders a chance to lay down their arms, but the noblemen refused. Both sides squared off. If push came to shove, the National Guard would crush the noblemen, but not without a bloody fight. And Louis knew it. Mustering his courage, the king ordered the nobles to stand down, now that the threat was passed. Situation diffused, everybody quietly dispersed, leaving Louis to contemplate what had just happened, and just how near a miss this day of daggers had been. Threats to Louis's person were only to be matched by threats to his mortal soul, his second ordeal. Without his knowing, the king's personal priest had taken the oath of loyalty back in January. When Louis learned of this betrayal, he spurned the priest, choosing instead another who had not taken the oath. Leaked to the press, Louis's spite was made a public scandal, and he was dragged through the mud by the popular press, declared a papist and a traitor. Crippled by indecision and keenly aware of his own shortcomings as a national ruler, the king grappled with the question of just what, if anything, he could do to save his own skin and his crown. After the Day of Daggers, it was obvious that his own life and the lives of his wife and young children 
were at stake. And yet it seemed that it was his spiritual health that he valued most. It was only after this spiritual shock that Louis quietly decided to break with the National Assembly and disavow the civil constitution of the clergy, to which he had lent his support. Only reluctantly had Louis played the role of citizen king. Now was the time to reclaim his legacy. Holy Week, and the royal family descended the steps of the Tuileries, bound for their carriage which would ferry them to Easter services held in the church of saint Cloud. But the royal family would not make it to the church. In fact, they didn't even make it out of the gates. Popular rumour, spread by Marat's propaganda network, had it that Louis would try one of these days to flee with his family. Concerned citizens from among the Corailles had taken it upon themselves to forestall any escape attempt. Danton was at the head of a large mob of saint culot who had staked out the gate leading out of the Tuileries. Spying the royal family boarding the carriage, they rushed inside with the help of some national guardsmen, blocking any path of escape. For the terrified occupants inside the carriage, Louis, Marie Antoinette and the crying Dauphin, the two hours they spent jostled, heckled and menaced by the mob, must have seemed like an eternity. When at one stage the king asked for the people to grant him the same freedom he had granted them, the vicious replies they returned convinced him not to parley. Even Lafayette, joined by Bailly and a fresh contingent of National Guardsmen, couldn't clear a path for the coach. With no way forward, Louis and his coachman pulled back inside, slinking away with his own life and the lives of his wife and child. But whatever majesty he had as a ruler, whatever shred of dignity he had in the eyes of the people, was at long last reduced to absolute tatters. Doors bolted shut, blinds closed. Louis retreated into his own mind, as worried advisers and hurried servants bustled about the royal apartments, an onslaught of jeers emanating from the streets below. For the queen, this had been the final straw. She could not live like this any longer, a bird in a gilded cage, in fear for her own life and the lives of her children. From her family in Austria, Marie Antoinette received assurances that the armies of the empire would aid in restoring Louis's full throne, but only if the royal family was safe and secure. Similar assurances had been made by the King of Spain, a message conveyed by advisers to the king. These advisers also passed on pleas from absolutist plotters and emigre nobles. Quit the city, regroup with the army and foreign allies, smite the godless National Assembly. Reluctantly, but nonetheless quite convinced, Louis finally agreed, now at the end of his tether. In order to flee, first the royal family would need to escape the Tuileries, and then flee Paris undetected and travel the hundreds of miles necessary to make it to France's closest border in then French-controlled Belgium. But all of this was easier said than done, and made all the more arduous an undertaking by the recent spate of high-profile noble flights. Of course, first the king's aunts fled to Rome back in February, but were soon followed by the king's other brother, the Comte de Provence, after his monarchist agitations in the south of France became known. And that's not to mention the hundreds of nobles that packed their bags after the Day of Daggers in protest to the way in which they were treated. Naturally, questions were raised by the assembly and by the press as to just how deeply the king was implicated in these aristocratic conspiracies to quit France. And of course, this bled into the wider question on everyone's mind. Would the king remain true to his word? Could he be trusted to play the role of citizen king any longer? As a precaution, Jacobin successfully lobbied for the formation of a small committee intended to outright prevent any further flights by those aristocrats deemed likely to flee. The royal family was one such potential flight risk. On the committee's order, the small force of soldiers protecting the Tuileries was reinforced and now several hundred National Guardsmen were installed to, by the Assembly's account, protect the royal family. Though in reality, they were there to keep the king at arm's length from any plots, plotters or conspiracies, and to keep him from slipping out of the palace. Watching all gateways were eagle-eyed sentries, and armed patrols scoured the grounds by night. By day, a small army of spies kept their government paymasters well informed of the royal family's activities. Overcoming such a formidable defence required three things. Cash, accomplices, and a good plan. Louis had none of these things. That was until a fetching young Swedish count, by the name of Hans Axel, disposed himself to the king's service. As Swedish envoy to the royal household, he was close to the king and had developed personal affection for the royal family, in particular Marie Antoinette, with whom he may possibly have had an affair. He provided 600,000 livres, his entire fortune, and prepared the plan. To begin with, Axel enlisted several accomplices. The sympathetic Baroness von Korth and the warlike general Francois-Claude de Bouillet. In addition, Axel scored the support of several servants and two discreet coachmen. 
Told by the king to keep the royal family together, come what may, Korf purchased, with Axel's money, a large, particularly well-fitted stagecoach. Certainly one fit for a king, and his family too. Over some weeks she had the coach driven around the streets of the city, though it was not to be the initial getaway coach. For that, Axel would hire a small stagecoach and quickly pick up the royal family from the Tuileries. Evading patrols, he would then deposit them outside of the city at the Port Saint Martin, where Korf's coach awaited. From here they would travel northeast through nearby towns, escorted on their way by several cavalry units organized by General Bouillet. All things going well, they would be deposited in the care of a loyalist garrison in the town of Montmédy, located near the border. The date for their escape was set for June 19th, but delayed until the following night, when it became known that an assembly spy would be absent then. Long after darkness had fallen, and the Tuileries was relatively deserted, the escape began. Marie Antoinette fetched her son and daughter, and made a brisk pace for one of the few places left unguarded by night, a vacant downstairs apartment. Avoiding detection, the Queen made it to the room and deposited her children with their governess, the Duchesse de Tourzel. Playing her part, the governess guided the children outside via an unlocked door, on the other side of which awaited Axel, attired as a coachman, gruff and crude, taking the occasional noseful of snuff. Kids and the governess aboard the coach, Axel then travelled around to the main courtyard, where his coach became just one of many parked. Now they waited, and waited, but where was the king? How Louis evaded detection to join his children is stunning in and of itself. Having stolen away to his wife's chambers, he donned a large brown coat and a grey wig, the typical attire of a lord who frequented the Tuileries, and who just so happened to bear a striking resemblance to the king. The same lord had been instructed a fortnight earlier to leave the Tuileries in the same clothes late each night. It was hoped that Louis would be mistaken for the lord and go unnoticed. And that's exactly what happened. Rather than trying to escape via a secret way or an unlocked door, the king simply left, walking straight out a side door towards the courtyard. At one stage, Louis went right past a sentry who failed to detect the ruse. After boarding Axel's coach, he found his children, but the queen was still absent. She was to join her family soon. Marie Antoinette had elected to leave by the same apartment she had used before, narrowly avoiding detection by Lafayette himself as she made her way past him on the way out. Spooked, she delayed her rendezvous by half an hour, but in short order she joined her family in the coach sometime before midnight. A while later, and the royal entourage, ably guided by Axel, was deposited beneath the tall arches of the Pont Saint Martin just outside the city limits. With a bit of luck, the Queen would pass for the Baroness von Korf and her children for the Baroness's own children. Louis would pass for her steward, Elizabeth for her friend, and the Governess de Tourzel for a Russian noble. I believe that it's here that Elizabeth, the King's sister, joined them here. And by the way, I do apologise, I've referred to her as the Queen's sister at least once or twice before, she is in fact the King's sister. Anyway, from here they would transfer to Korf's far larger and far finer luxury coach which was piloted by two royal guardsmen, liveried in the uniforms of an émigré noble's footman. Axel rode ahead on the next leg of the journey towards the small township of Bondy. Once arrived, he procured fresh horses and then bid everyone farewell, riding ahead to their intended destination at the northeastern frontier. Their journey out of Paris avoided any checkpoints, and so they need not have deployed their documentation showing their final destination as being the distant city of Frankfurt. On the way, they passed through several cities, townships and villages, intending to rendezvous with the loyal captain and his detachment of hussars. At some point along the road between Chantrix and Chalon, Dawn's first tendrils of orange light broke through the clouds. Journeying for the rest of the day, the royal family were in an agitated but upbeat mood. Louis was sure that he had outfoxed the assembly, Lafayette in particular, whom he knew would be quite vexed by their flight. It was the Marquis's men, after all, who had let the king and the queen slip. Uneven cobbles and broken stones hindered their trip. At one point their coach crashed while traversing a low bridge, damaging a wheel. Lengthy repairs were required. After this mishap, the coach was slowed down to a walking paced crawl. As a result, it was not until mid-evening that the royal family entered the village of Pont de Sonville. And to make things worse, the expected hussars were nowhere in sight. As it had transpired, a few hours earlier the detachment had been driven off by the local peasants, wary from exorbitant taxation, who presumed that the soldiers were there to collect debts. But no matter, there was another detachment of dragoons awaiting them at the next town. So on the royal escapees went, after taking on fresh horses and provisions at the town post house. 
For a second time that night, however, the royal family were left high and dry. After stopping in Sant Menehulde, they found the dragoons dispersed throughout the town's alehouses and taverns. Hours earlier, their captain had been misinformed by the Hussar captain and told that the royal family was not coming, and so he dismissed his men. Knowing that he had made a terrible mistake once he spotted the royal coach trundling into town, the dragoon captain rushed over to explain the situation. After saluting the king, he reported that the planned escort would be delayed until he could muster his dragoons, by now rip-roaring drunk. Here, the royal family waited a while, whilst villagers gathered around the coach, eyeing up its gold furnishings and green and green sheen. It was far too expensive a coach to be parked here, of all places. Who would be here, in such a fine vehicle, and in the middle of the night no less? A captain had saluted the occupants, hadn't he? Those gathered around were getting suspicious. Some among them called upon a nearby National Guard garrison to arrest the interloping dragoons. They also wanted them to arrest the king, whom they correctly surmised was in the coach. Fortunately for the royal family, they rode on out of town just in the nick of time, right before the soldiers arrived. Quite unwittingly, they had escaped. Not long after their close call, the royal family entered the forest village of Clermont, and from there they took to the North Road. Little did they know, but hot on their heels was a pair of riders, the postmaster of Saint Menehulde and his brother. It was unfortunate that the postmaster had been in the village at the time. Unlike the vast majority of Frenchmen, and indeed all the villagers, he recognised the king and queen by sight. He first knew the queen from his army days, when he had caused to see the royal couple when out on parades. And he confirmed his recognition of the king beyond a doubt by comparing what he had seen to Louis' regal likeness printed on the Assinat. Racing out to the road where he had seen the coach, he intended to apprehend the king and queen, but they'd already left. But they'd already left. So the postmaster set off in hot pursuit, grabbing his brother, who knew the roads better. On horsepack, they easily outpaced Korf's coach and beat the royal entourage to the next village. A little while later, around midnight, the coach meandered into the picturesque little village of Varenne, nestled deep in the heart of the Argonne Forest. Having beaten the coach into the village, the postmaster frantically alerted some locals, who quite reasonably dismissed his wild claims that the king occupied the incoming carriage. Word had not yet arrived from the capital of the royal flight, but just as the postmaster was brushed off by the locals, the coach crawled in and came to a halt on the main road. With the coach now stationary, the postmaster spied the opportunity for a closer look at the carriage and its occupants. But he needed to do it quietly, so that he might not startle the royal family and cause them to flee once more. So together, the postmaster and his brother, still on horseback, stole up behind the carriage. From here they trotted right past the carriage, loudly announcing that they needed fresh horses for their journey northwards to Grand Parthai. But the coach's curtains were closed and none of the passengers visible. Nonetheless, the postmaster was convinced the king and queen were inside. Picking up the pace, he raced through to the lower levels of the town, where he found the residence of the local administrator. Varenne's procurator, Jean-Baptiste Sos, was less than pleased to be woken at such an ungodly hour, but dutifully listened to the testimony of the brothers. Even though no word had yet reached the isolated town regarding the king's flight, Sauce realised the seriousness of the situation, and so donned his cloak and went out to rally the National Guard. In the meantime, the royal family was again on the move. It was only about 100 miles from Varenne to the border, the last leg of their desperate flight. But the royal family would not make it to the border. They were not to even make it out of the town. Just up ahead, near a large marble archway, Sauce's guardsmen lay in ambush. As the coach approached, several of the guardsmen rushed out of the darkness, brandishing their muskets, while Sauce hollered at the coach, demanding it stop. It did not. Again, Sauce barked an order to stop, but the coach rumbled onwards. The guardsmen now leveled their rifles, taking aim at the coach, as Sauce issued a final warning. Halt or be fired upon. At this, the carriage stopped. The procurator, now standing beside the coach, changed demeanour quite quickly, politely requesting the occupants hand over their passports. With his own lamplight inadequate to make out the finer print of the leather-bound passports, Sauce went to a nearby well-lit tavern. Upon inspection, the passports seemed genuine. Indeed, they were all real passports, not even forgeries. The postmaster from Saint Menehulde was mistaken. The coach really didn't contain the king. But the postmaster insisted that he had seen the king and queen. For Source to know definitively, he had to see the occupants' faces. But more than that, he had to know beyond any shadow of doubt that it was in fact the royal couple 
and for that he needed a second opinion. Not wanting to take the risk that this was the king and queen, Source had sent word to the resident judge that he had detained the occupants of a coach suspected to be housing the royal family. Monsieur le juge Jacques d'Este knew the king by sight, having served the royal family for several years. After dispatching the message, Source returned to the coach, handing back the passports and asking to see the faces of the occupants. Low light made this near impossible, so the occupants were made to leave the carriage and accompany the procurator back to his upstairs home come workshop. The young children, not at all understanding why the adults around them seemed to be so worried, gave in to their wariness and slept deeply on an old straw bed. The Duquesse de Tourzel waited on them patiently, quietly and forlornly, praying for a miracle. But the torment the governess felt was nothing compared to the hopelessness, the fear, the apprehension felt by the king and queen. As Marie Antoinette took a seat, resigning herself to fate, Louis agitatedly paced across the room, fidgeting and grumbling. None had to wait very long. Deste arrived in a flurry of activity, took one glance at the Duquesse de Corf's steward, and immediately knew him to be King Louis XVI of France. Quickly taking a deferential knee, the judge exclaimed, O oh, sire! To which Louis replied, Yes, indeed, I am your king. The king explained his rationale for the escape to both Deste and Source, who took sympathy with the royal family's plight. By early morning, a squadron of National Guardsmen arrived in Varennes, led by a Captain Romuth and a representative of the National Assembly. Romuth conveyed the Marquis de Lafayette's orders that the royal family be returned to Paris post-haste. All those who now stood in the King's presence were cowed by his composure and regal presence. But in spite of their sympathy to the royal family, the representative and Romuth were unable to deviate from their orders. The representative handed over the Assembly's official recall to the King, who read it silently. The Queen read it too, and took the words less than well, exclaiming that she would not allow her children to be contaminated. Her outburst did not go down well with those assembled, who murmured their protests at such a scandalous outburst. Word of the King's presence had awoken the villagers of Varennes, who now flocked to Saucer's home for a glimpse of the royal family. Much unlike the soldiers and officials who were packed inside, the villagers bore no sympathy for the King nor his family, and it called for the soldiers to escort them back to the capital in fetters. As they clamoured for the king's return, there came a commotion from nearby. Better late than never, the captain who was meant to have escorted the royal family from as far back as the Pont de Sainville arrived with a dozen of his hussars. The captain forced his way through the throng and made his presence known to Louis. After making his excuses, the captain implored the king to steal out of Varennes where the hussars could ensure his safety for a mad dash to the frontier. For at least a time, the king entertained this notion, weighing his chances of success even as he received guarantees of his family's safety from the assembly's representative. As the king mulled things over and the captain whispered assurances, National Guardsmen arrived in droves, forestalling any hope for a last, desperate escape before it even began. What few hussars there were could never overpower the guardsmen. This was the end of the line. Louis' escape attempt had failed. Requesting to be left alone with his family for a few minutes, Louis called Source over to him as the rest shuffled downstairs. The king made an impassioned plea to the procurator, begging him to retrieve a secret black box from the coach. Source dutifully obliged the king, retrieving the box and its key, returning both to Louis. On the king's order, Source then emptied out the contents of the box. As Source held the door shut, incriminating papers were strewn everywhere, which were then taken by Elizabeth and the queen and torn into pieces. Louis then set the paper shreds alight. Smoke and the flickers of flame were seen emanating from the upstairs room. Guards rushed up to Source's room and nearly knocked the door of its hinges, trying to get in. Source delayed them at the door as long as he could, just long enough to allow the Queen to take the burning papers and throw them from the window, where they scattered with the mid-morning breeze. The soldiers quickly separated Source and the royal family and held both under close guard. The royal family offered no resistance as they were finally escorted from the townhouse and into an awaiting carriage, hemmed in from all sides by the baying mob. The Hussar Captain too attempted to board the coach, but was torn away by the crowds. In a humiliating parody of their previously pathed route of escape, the royal family were escorted by the National Guard back to Paris. Their return trip was not without drama. saint des mayor made an appearance, decrying the king's disloyalty to the people. Moving on, the coach was approached by a mounted noble who saluted the king, a gesture for which he was shot in the back by a guardsman. A bit of blood seemed to encourage the crowd 
who ceased merely to accost the royal family, but now pelted their carriage with rocks and menaced them with muskets and pitchforks. The next village over, and the coach passed by a parish priest who viciously decried the king's betrayal and encouraged his frenzied followers to harass the royal coach. Eventually, two assembly delegates rendezvoused with the coach, Antoine Bonave and Jérôme Petion. In near silence and stifling heat, they accompanied the royal family. There was all good small talk, until Elizabeth pleaded with the delegates, making the case for their escape. Sincerely affected, Barnard promised leniency, a promise he knew he couldn't keep. After a two-day return trip, the royal entourage re-entered Paris on June 25th, five days after initially setting out. Flanked on all sides by soldiers and bombarded by the crowds, the king's coach trundled down the champs élysées under the scornful gaze of Parisians of all orders. It seemed half of Paris had gathered to witness the king's ignoble return, but none uttered so much as a peep. No one dared. Written in bold print and plastered on the walls were declarations that hecklers would be hanged and sympathizers would be flogged. Louis was equally subdued. As he and his family were escorted from the coach back into the Tuileries, an assembly delegate deferentially greeted the royals, after which he switched gears entirely, berating Louis for his reckless and foolish actions. He then switched back again and disposed himself to the king's will. In response, Louis stated, I seem to be more at your orders than you are at mine. With the king back behind gilded bars under close guard, the National Assembly then set about throwing away the keys to the cell 